Welcome to the Human Health Campus Pediatric Nuclear Medicine Webinar Series. This webinar is entitled Cortical Static Renal Scintigraphy and Radionuclide Cystographies and is presented by Diego de Palma from Varese, Italy. I am pleased to present this seminar to you on behalf of the Nuclear Medicine and Diagnostic Imaging Section of the International Atomic Energy Agency in collaboration with the European Association of Nuclear Medicine. This webinar will run through five steps. The first is dedicated to technique, clarifying how to perform studies of the highest possible quality. The second talks about indications, underlining the strengths and weaknesses of each technique, their timing according to the disease, the clinical question, and the patient's characteristics. The third will review the clinical applications based on the recommendation published in clinical guidelines and their possible evolution. The fourth is constituted by clinical cases. The fifth and last contains our take-home messages. Section 1. Technique. To perform a cortical renal scan, you must inject the child with technetium 99M, labeled with dimer captosuccinic acid, or DMSA. This radiopharmaceutical is taken up by the cells of the proximal convolute tubule either through the vascular pole or the urine pole. About 50% of the injected activity is excreted through urine in the first few hours, so diapers or other urine collecting tools must be discarded according to national regulation. The injected activity must be scaled down according to European Association of Nuclear Medicine guidelines. The acquisition requires a standard set of three projections, the posterior view and two posterior oblique at 30 to 35 degrees. Acquisition must be done with the child supine on the gamma camera. The child will have to stand still for about 30 minutes, so some immobilizing device and some entertainment will help. The anterior projection is mandatory in case of abnormalities of number, shape, and position, especially for the purpose of correctly calculating the split renal function, which we will discuss later. The anterior projection is much more difficult to acquire because you either must place the camera surface close to the child's face or place the child in a prone position. Both positions are uncomfortable. Each image must contain at least 250 KCTS, although 200 can be enough for the oblique. It is useful to also set a camera stop at 600 seconds. The recommended matrix is 256 by 256, although 128 by 128 is acceptable, especially when you reduce the field of view by zooming, and the pixel size is less than 2 millimeters, as happens by having a field of view no larger than 25 centimeters. This picture shows how we can help the child to stand still and how the test can be performed in a fun and agreeable way. Kidneys move with breathing. This movement increases when a child cries and is added to the body movements. Nevertheless, it is still possible to obtain a high quality scan. Each scan must be checked for quality before dismissing the patient. A good quality scan must show kidneys with sharp edges. DMSA images naturally have a high contrast in respect to background in patients with normal renal function. Blurring of the outline, especially at the poles, is a sign of movement. Since DMSA is taken up only in the kidney cortex, the kidney's picture must show the cortical medullary differentiation as we see in the picture. A loss of visualization of this relation can be attributed to movement, the use of a wrong collimator, excessive distance between the table and the camera head, or to an incorrect energy peak setting. 
When all immobilization techniques fail and there is no chance to have some kind of sedation, a good scan can still be obtained by changing the technique and acquiring a dynamic scan that is 40 frames, 15 seconds each. Consequently, we apply a motion correction for the corresponding frames so that you can then sum them to obtain a single image. It is not recommended to use a framing time below 15 seconds, otherwise the images will be much too faint for correct repositioning. If the software allows, the scan result can also be improved by eliminating the most blurred frames from the file. Before beginning with this technique, read the manual carefully on how these programs work. This slide depicts an example of the above-mentioned procedure. At the top left, we see the raw dynamic sequence of a child with a left kidney acute infection. The red circle represents the time at which movement occurred and a typical movement-induced blurred frame. The top right image depicts the result from the unprocessed sum of the 40 images. At the bottom right, the dynamic sequence after motion correction with automatic software is shown. The red circle shows the improved alignment of the previously misplaced frames. The bottom left image depicts the sum of the images after correction, clearly demonstrating better quality with respect to the image at the top right. The main information obtained from renal scans is the split renal function. This means the percentage of the total renal function pertaining to each kidney. Its value is obtained by tracing a region of interest, which is known as ROI, around each kidney and then calculating the counts in each kidney ROI divided by the total counts of both kidney ROIs. In patients with normal renal function, the background ROIs are not strictly necessary. They are mandatory when the renal function is reduced, which will later result in a higher background activity. In these conditions, nevertheless, the reliability of the obtained values drops similarly to renal function. In the lower left-hand corner, the reference values can be seen. The split renal function obtained with DMSA nowadays is the reference value for all other methods. For precise calculation of DMSA in case of an ectopic kidney, you need the anterior view. The value to use is the geometric mean of the counts pertaining to each kidney in the anterior and posterior view. You have to multiply these counts and then extract the square root. The slide shows in the lower half an example calculation in a case of lumbar ectopy of the right kidney with SRF calculated by geometric mean compared to the one obtained from the posterior view only. When you visualize an ectopy or a single renal silhouette, calculating an SRF can become less precise or meaningless. There is still debate among experts as to whether performing a SPECT acquisition truly increases the clinical accuracy of the scan. In reality, it can be performed in a great majority of cases with the same injected activity, scan time, and without sedation. Obtained images are different and require their own proper learning curve. It is reported an increase in sensitivity, but a loss of specificity. The impact of technical evolution, such as new detectors, new reconstruction systems, etc., is still uncertain. <laughs>
Typical protocol uses a low energy high resolution parallel hole collimator, a 128 by 128 matrix with step and shoot mode 120 frames, 15 seconds each, a motion correction when necessary, and an iterative reconstruction. SPECT CT is not recommended because of the additional radiation burden of CT. A pediatric palate can allow reduction in orbit range, increasing the quality. The use of pinhole collimators, although they offer increased resolution, is also hampered by low sensitivity and a limited field of view to one kidney at a time, consequently leading to much longer acquisition times. The overall gain in respect to LEHRP collimator mounted on modern cameras is then questionable and should be carefully weighted. Direct radionuclide cystography, DRC, has substantially the same technical principles as voiding cystourethrography, VCUG, that is the filling of the bladder with an indwelling catheter connected to a bottle. The positioning of the bladder catheter is performed under maximized sterile conditions, and a full dosage antibiotic coverage is prescribed for the day of the examination and the following one. The bladder is then emptied, if necessary, through the tube. For DRC, the suggested catheter is a urinary catheter with no balloon that does not block the urine outflow, allowing the child to void when the stimulus arrives. The radial pharmaceutical is injected directly into the bladder by three-way stopcock at the beginning of the scan to check the correct positioning of the tube and that the maximum concentration of the tracer is injected into the bladder from the beginning. The tube is then connected to a bottle of warm saline and the bladder is progressively filled. The scan starts the moment the radiopharmaceutical is injected. 20 megabecquerels of protechnotate is sufficient. The use of a low energy but highly sensitive collimator allows for maximum sensitivity. The loss of resolution does not matter in this clinical setting. The field of view must largely encompass the kidneys and the bladder, so it is better to refrain from overzooming. The bladder filling stops when the child spontaneously voids or when the child asks to stop. If the child has a neurological bladder, it is recommended to stop the filling at the achievement of the expected maximum bladder capacity. A formula is shown in the next slide. In the upper left corner, there's a simple formula for calculating the expected bladder capacity. The picture on the right shows a good setting for performing DRC, with a toy and a parent amusing a child whose torso is immobilized with the Velcro strap and two rolled bed sheets. Please note as the bottle must not hang too high, maximum 80 centimeters above the table level. In non-toilet trained children, the acquisition of at least two full filling voiding cycles is strongly recommended because the vesico-ureteral reflux can be intermittent. This picture shows a full series of consecutive images from a DRC, five seconds each. It is evident that no reflux appears during the first cycles, the first two rows, and a bilateral reflux is seen during the second. Indirect radionuclide cystography, IRC, is performed after dynamic renal scintigraphy using the activity collected in the bladder at the end of the scan. Normally, this requires the child's cooperation because the bladder emptying images are recorded after a repositioning of the camera head and the child. The child should then void at the technician's command. This implies that the child must be toilet trained. It is possible to record bladder emptying images of a non-toilet trained child and seldom find a reflux. However, the overall reliability of this approach is generally lower, especially in children with a dilated excretory system.
The upper tract should ideally be empty at the time of bladder emptying and the background activity low. The most reliable IRC can be obtained with tubular tracers, good renal function, and a non-dilated upper tract. The acquisition setting is the same as that for DRC, but the collimator used is the same as the dynamic renal scan. It is necessary to acquire 6 to 10 pre-voiding frames and 6 to 10 post-voiding frames for a better appreciation of the reflux dynamic. It is normally possible to acquire with only one void. The pictures on the upper left hand side of the slide show a dynamic renal scan with a smaller right kidney. The voiding images below show a completely empty upper tract in the pre-void image, the rising of activity to the right renal pelvis, the blue arrow, during micturition and the typical refilling of the bladder from refluxed activity at the end of the bladder contraction. The picture on the right shows a good patient camera setup for this scan in a toilet trained boy. The second part of this talk discusses the clinical indications of the above described examinations. The static DMSA renal scan is able to localize small amounts of functioning renal tissue and must be used for the confirmation of an ultrasound suspect renal agenesis or the complete loss of function of a multicystic kidney. It is also necessary for the functional evaluation of the kidney in case of abnormalities of shape and position. DMSA scan is also the clinical reference standard for the confirmation of renal parenchymal involvement urinary tract infection with associated febrile syndrome, the so-called acute DMSA, and for the evaluation of the presence of irreversible post-infection scars or focal damage due to congenital dysplasia, or late DMSA. Late DMSA is actually the clinical reference method for such a diagnosis. There is no hurry to ascertain the presence of an abnormality of number, shape, and position of the kidney in asymptomatic babies. So the scan can be safely postponed until the complete postnatal kidney maturation is achieved, that is after about the fourth month of age or later. Acute DMSA must be performed during the acute phase of the infection, which means no later than seven days after the onset of fever, the earlier the better. The evaluation of the sequela of infection requires a time span of at least six months between the last UTI episode and the scan because there have been reports of defects after three to four months. DRC has the unique characteristic of allowing a continuous monitoring of the whole urinary tract during the scan time without additional radiation exposure. On the other hand, it has a poor anatomical definition, especially regarding the urethral status. DRC is then a first choice for reflux studies in children with known anatomy, for the follow-up in children with known reflux, or for children with a strong clinical suspicion of reflux not visualized at the cystourethrography. The use of this test meets no agreement for children whose urethral abnormalities with outflow obstruction are very rare. When posterior urethral valves are suspected, VCUG is mandatory. This slide directly compares the three methods for studying the vesico-ureteral reflux using a bladder catheter. The VCUG is a radiological method which gives better anatomical detail, especially about the urethra and the bladder wall. Moreover, it defines the grade of the reflux. It has the higher radiation burden and is less sensitive than DRC. DRC has a very low radiation burden 
about 0.1 millisieverts, but gives a poor anatomical detail. CSG, cystosonography, performed with ultrasound and sonographic contrast media, has no radiation but requires great medical skills. CSG does not allow the operator to check both your readers together and sometimes requires sedation. IRC is the only technique that allows the evaluation of the split renal function and the presence or absence of focal renal damage or reflux with a very limited radiation burden. On the other hand, the accuracy for either purpose is lower compared to static renal scan and DRC. Toilet trained children with an unclear history of febrile UTI and no urinary tract dilatation at ultrasound can be initially studied with IRC. The results will help to decide further examinations, for instance performing a DRC or a VCUG in case of renal damage when IRC shows no reflux. Currently, there are four published clinical guidelines describing the clinical framework in which radionuclide studies should be utilized. The National Institute for Clinical Excellence guidelines follow two different strategies depending on whether the child is younger or older than three months of age. The American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines are applicable between the ages of six months and two years. The Italian Society of Pediatric Nephrology guidelines are applicable between six months and three years. There is no defined age range for the European Association of Urology and European Association of Pediatric Urology. All guidelines agree in suggesting that no tests more invasive than ultrasound are needed after the first febrile UTI. There is a general agreement that evaluation of UTI-related staple damage requires a static renal scan and may recommend performing it after a second episode of febrile UTI. Reflux studies will be performed in DMSA positive cases. All of these guidelines are evidence based according to published literature. Their recommendations are classified according to the level of evidence. A common assumption is that antibiotic prophylaxis is unable to prevent UTI-related damage. However, this statement is still a matter of debate. There are studies that established the usefulness of acute DMSA for identifying true renal involvement during febrile UTI. It was demonstrated that the use of acute DMSA as a screening tool during febrile UTI makes it possible to avoid unnecessary VCUG. This approach was named the top-down strategy after suggesting a baseline concept to look first at the upper tract, top, and then at reflux, bottom, only if the top is involved. This approach is endorsed by the European Society of Pediatric Radiology and, when compared to other guidelines, maximizes the identification of renal damage. The older strategy that looks for reflux first is named bottom-up. Here, a flowchart depicts the difference between the two strategies. On the left, the former approach bottom-up, which is not recommended by recent guidelines, and on the right, the top-down approach. With the publication of new multicentric studies, such as the river or the duty, which are expected in the next few years, it is possible that new recommendations will appear. Guidelines, however, must never substitute teamwork for assuring that children experience the best available care.
It is also likely that the demonstration of the efficacy of antibiotic prophylaxis in preventing febrile UTI recurrences in children with medium-high grade reflux would support the usefulness of acute DMSA in identifying patients at risk. Let's get started with some clinical cases. Please note that every time there's a question to answer, there is a yellow box in the slide warning that the next click will show you the right answer. So think first on the correct answer. Pay attention to the sex of the child because it is well known that congenital high-grade reflux has a male prevalence and reflux associated with bladder voiding dysfunction is more common in females. The first case deals with a young girl with the classic febrile UTI and a DMSA scan performed during the acute phase of infection. This case shows that you always need a full set of DMSA images to write a correct report. Some infections involve only a small amount of kidney and, if this area is on the anterior view of the kidney, the posterior view alone cannot show it. Another case of acute DMSA with the full set of images. How will you report this scan? Remember to think of your answer before clicking. The comparison between the acute DMSA image and the late one, performed six months later, clarifies the presence of the defect close to the upper pole of the left kidney in the first image. Such subtle defects require significant attention. Here is a third case of acute DMSA. In this case, the ultrasound was reported normal. What do you think these images represent? The presence of an uptake defect is of course very evident, but it is important to note how the defect presents a clear-cut delimitation towards the normal upper pole and that this limit corresponds to the border between the upper and the middle calyx system, that is where the separation occurs between the upper system and the lower system in case of a complete duplication of the excretory system. The lower moiety is one with reflux. The late image shows the normalization of the defect the slight reduction in uptake is probably due to a mild degree of reflux-associated dysplasia. It is important to include in the report all information available from our images. Here is a fourth case of acute DMSA with a clear defect at the left upper pole and a lighter one at the left lower pole. What is the next imaging step? Of course, the voiding cystourethrography is also a valid option. It is true, on the other hand, that the renal bladder ultrasound was completely normal, so why not save some irradiation to this girl's gonads using DRC? 
The only clinical question here is if there is or is not a reflex, and DRC is the best answering tool. The DRC shows what is undoubtedly a high-grade vesico-ureteral reflex. DRC does not allow the categorization of reflex into the radiological 5 degrees, but it does permit the distinction between high-grade and low-grade that is a clinically significant distinction. In cases like this, DMSA in acute phase gave the key information for leading to the diagnosis of reflux and to the beginning of antibiotic prophylaxis. This girl was infection-free for the following year. Notice that according to clinical guidelines, this girl would have had no further imaging after ultrasound and a dilating reflux would have been missed. A patient's history is not always trustworthy for small babies. The information given is largely dependent upon the parents and the interpretation of the symptoms. This is a typical case. Do we need further investigations? It is important to remember that the overall sensitivity of ultrasound for renal defects due to infection, either reversible or irreversible, is unsatisfactory. The defects are peripheral and alter the renal outline. The scan was performed far from the last febrile episode, so there is a reasonable chance that these defects represent scars. A following DRC showed vesico-ureteral reflux on the left side where there is scarred kidney. This is an illustrative example of a reflux study suggested by the presence of an abnormal late DMSA. Here is another case of uncertain medical history in small babies. The ultrasound information about renal length is useful but it has to be completed with a percentile nomogram. As in the case before, a DMSA was requested to complete the clinical picture and address further imaging if necessary. As you can see, the difference in split renal function is greater in the left kidney due to the difference in longitudinal renal length. How will you report this scan? Here is a demonstration of all the findings present in the images. Note overall the presence in the left kidney of a sort of straight line separating the two halves of the kidney. This is a typical sign of complete duplication. The SRF of the right kidney presents a small functional hypoplasia. Performing a VCUG in this case would have most likely been more beneficial. Nevertheless, a DRC showed a bilateral reflux and, on the left side, an aspect highly indicative of complete duplication. Here is a new case describing a male child with a prenatal finding of mild dilatation. Do we need further imaging? A dynamic renal scan with MAG3 is very important in giving the split renal function and the entity of renal impairment, allowing the distinction between obstructive and non-obstructive dilatation. In these images, the right kidney is completely normal, 
so it is very likely that we are not dealing with a complete duplication. It is evident the great functional impairment of the left kidney, and it is important in cases like this to look carefully at the excretory phase because a reflux can be observed during the spontaneous voidings. Look at the frames between 14 to 17 minutes. If there is enough residual activity in the bladder, it is useful and strongly recommended to continue the acquisition, especially when the upper tract is empty, for better assessment of the presence and entity of the reflux, as in these images. Here are three more things to remember for better knowledge of the clinical context in which our scans are requested. Here is the last case. As you can see, there is a four-year gap between antibiotic prophylaxis stop and the first reported UTI. Do we need further imaging? Here are the images. The indirect radionuclide cystography was performed when the child strongly requested to void. What would be your report of this scan? The parenchymal image shows a bilateral renal damage. Look at the multiple bilateral cleft of the renal outline. This finding, likely an acquired damage than a genital one, leads us to think that some UTI was missed. At the time of IRC, there was an incomplete upper tract emptying, and its interpretation is quite difficult. So what do you think we can do now? When the upper tract still contains activity, a good option in toilet trained children is to wait some time, let the child relax and drink, and then perform a second voiding, checking in advance the cleaning of the ureters. Sometimes, like in this case, you can have a high quality IRC, absolutely diagnostic. Here are our key points always to be taken into account. This is a case in which dynamic renal scan and IRC carry out the one-stop shop concept. The last three slides will review our learning objectives. Cortical renal scan is the reference method for assessing presence and entity of congenital and acquired post-infectious renal damage in children. Performed according to EANM guidelines implies a low radiation burden and are a safe and economical imaging tool. Its usefulness as a diagnostic tool for distinguishing febrile UTI with or without renal involvement is still under investigation. DRC is a very sensitive tool with a very low radiation burden. Since its main limitation is its poor anatomical detail, it is routinely not recommended as a first diagnostic test. However, it is ideal for follow-up or post-surgery studies.
The combination of MAG-3 and IRC is the simplest, least invasive, and least irradiating way to fully evaluate the urinary tract in toilet-trained children. Its results will be useful for the follow-up. The quality of the study must be carefully checked, and sometimes a tailored sequence of images is necessary.